Hello and welcome to the Clinical Liver Disease video series. CLD is an official digital learning publication of the ASLD. I'm Dr. Justin Boyke, Assistant Professor of Medicine and Hepatology and Associate Editor with CLD. I'm here with Dr. Nabil Wahid, who's one of the Gastroenterology and Hepatology Fellows at Northwestern Medicine and author of the recent article, Turlopressin for Hepatorenal Syndrome, The Practical Choice for Clinicians. Um, and is recently published in our issue of CLD. All right. Thank you, Dr. Wahid, for joining us today. Um, first question, how is HRS diagnosed? Yeah, so there's a couple of different uh, diagnostic criteria um, for hepatorenal syndrome that uh, various different societies have come up with. The one that we included um, in our review article is one of the more cited uh, diagnostic criteria, which is from the International Club of Ascites and their revised consensus um, guidelines. And they essentially include uh, the diagnostic criteria for HRS to include uh, essentially excluding other causes of acute kidney injury. Um, so one is, um, first off, having some sort of underlying cirrhosis um, with ascites. Second is ruling out uh, pre-renal azotemia, so essentially patients who don't respond to an albumin challenge and uh, do not respond to an albumin or a diuretic withdrawal in 48 hours. Um, any of those would be more suggestive of a pre-renal azotemia. Um, Additionally, ruling out any sort of underlying shock, um, like hemorrhagic shock or septic shock, which would be more consistent with acute tubular necrosis. And additionally, ruling out any sort of like structural kidney disease. So patients with gross hematuria or gross proteinuria uh, would be more consistent with having a renal injury from another etiology that's more structural in nature. Um, we also include in our review article that there's um, some urinary biomarkers that are suggestive of hepatorenal syndrome. So for example, patients with a FE urea or a fractional excretion of urea less than 28 um, has a, a relatively high positive predictive value for hepatorenal syndrome. So all of those are essentially suggestive of hepatorenal syndrome. Uh, but no one in particular is, is you know, a, a actual diagnosis of HRS in itself. Excellent. Um, with regards to, to terlopressin, which is a focus of the article, how effective is, is terlopressin compared to other traditional treatments for HRS? Yeah, so there's been quite a few randomized control trials um, comparing terlopressin with other uh, treatments for hepatorenal syndrome. So in the United States, prior to the FDA approval of terlipressin, um, the primary treatment for HRS um, outside of the clinical or the critical care setting um, was a cocktail of minadrine, octreotide, and albumin. And there's, there's pretty strong evidence um, showing that um, terlipressin um, has higher rates of complete HRS reversal um, compared to that cocktail of midodrin, octreotide, and albumin. Um, when compared to vasopressors, which is one of the other treatments for HRS other than terlipressin, uh, terlipressin has been shown in various other RCTs and uh, systematic reviews to either be equivocal or superior um, to, to other vasopressors. Um, and, um, you know, the, the one advantage of terlipressin is that it doesn't have to be used in a critical care setting. Um, so um, even if it's equivocal to other vasopressors, it still has certain um, clinical advantages, practically speaking. Are there established clinical protocols for using terlipressin in the inpatient setting? Yeah, so the manufacturer of terlipressin has released a clinical protocol for um, for for its use. Um, we kind of adapted that in our paper and um, included our own clinical protocol um, based on some of the data for terlipressin and its clinical use of, uh, abroad, um, where it's been used for several decades. 
Um, so in our second figure, in figure two, um, we propose a clinical protocol for the use of terlipressin, which essentially includes first off diagnosing HRS. So once HRS has been diagnosed, um, we we suggest and the manufacturer suggests using terlipressin um, as uh, intermittent infusions every six hours. Um, there, it is worth noting that there is some data showing that um, a continuous infusion of terlipressin might actually decrease adverse events, but um, that uh, is off-label dosing, so we don't include that in our figure. Um, once terlipressin has been started, you want to continue monitoring serum creatinines at least on a daily basis. Uh, the day four creatinine, so four days after um, terlipressin has been initiated, it's kind of the key um, serum creatinine measurement to gauge how well terlipressin is actually working. So if terlipressin or if the serum creatinine decreases by greater than 30%, um, we recommend continuing terlipressin. If it decreases, but not by 30%, by less than 30%, um, we recommend uh, doubling the dose of terlipressin to try to increase its efficacy. And if the serum creatinine doesn't budge or it continues to, to rise, uh, we recommend stopping it because um, it doesn't seem to be working in that specific patient. Excellent. You, you touched on the fact that terlipressin has one of the advantages of being administered on a, a general floor and not in the critical care ICU setting. Uh, what are some important considerations uh, that we should take into account when uh, using and administering terlipressin? Yeah, so we included a nice table in our review to, to summarize some of the contraindications, both relative and absolute contraindications and adverse uh, reactions of terlipressin. Um, so in any patient with underlying ischemia of any sort, whether it's peripheral ischemia, coronary ischemia, or otherwise, uh, terlipressin should not be initiated. Uh, the other major consideration is that um, terlipressin can increase the risk of uh, pulmonary edema. So in patients with volume overload or pulmonary edema, um, or high risk of developing pulmonary edema, like severe heart failure, um, terlipressin should not be used or used with extreme caution. Um, and at most uh, centers that are starting to use terlipressin in the United States, uh, terlipressin is used on a continuous uh, pulse oximetry for, floor. So patients generally should be on continuous pulse oximetry. And if they develop any signs of volume overload or hypoxia, uh, terlipressin should be stopped in those patients. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, on behalf of all of us at the CLD team, I hope you found this uh, discussion on terlipressin and its clinical use uh, very helpful. For more information about uh, this issue and other topics, please visit us at www.cldlearning.com. And thanks again for watching.